All right. Well, listen, everybody, thank you very much for your patience. I'm really sorry that I can't be there in person and I'm really sorry that I can't hear you right now, but I'll go ahead and, uh, uh, you know, I hope to share with you some of the really interesting research that we've been doing over the last 10 or 15 years. So I need to say right at the start that I am not a dinosaur specialist. Uh, I'm a paleobiologist and I specialize in the study of the soft parts of animals skin, feathers, hair, things like that. So, uh, you know, when it comes to paleontology, uh, you know, I, I'm a bit of a jack of all trades. I don't specialize in, in any one group, but I do specialize in the study of soft tissues. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So you will see some dinosaurs in here, but you'll also see a smattering of lots of other different types of fossil and modern creatures. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, one particular area of research which I've been pursuing for about the last uh, nearly 15 years now at this point, and that's the study of fossil color. So in other words, you know, how do we infer or reconstruct the original colors that ancient animals had when they were alive? So apologies, let me just get to the right screen. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things we do as paleobiologists is we try to understand well, we try to bring the past to life. So how do we go from a living, breathing, moving organism, like the lovely tortoiseshell butterfly on the left, to something that is effectively locked in stone? So I spend a lot of my time thinking about the processes that happen as you transform a living organism to a fossil. And conversely, if we want to bring the fossil back to life, as it were, what clues are we looking for? So what evidence are we looking for in that fossil? What tiny features of an animal's anatomy, of their chemistry, can we look for and can we find that will help us work out how that animal, well, what they looked like, you know, how they moved and so on. So when, when it comes to color uh, in particular, you know, we live in a very colorful world. The world around us is just, you know, uh, uh, riven with all kinds of colors. The animals and plants we see around us, they make colors in many different ways. And we see a, a, a dizzying array of colors and color patterns. And animals use these colors for many different functions, for camouflage, for deterring predators, for sexual display, for advertising fitness. And so presumably animals used these sorts of colors and color patterns for similar uh, functions in the past. The problem is when we look at the vast majority of fossils, they don't show preserve any evidence of color at all, even when we preserve the soft tissues. So here we have uh, fossils, sea scorpion, plants, amphibians, insects, trilobites, and other types of arthropods and a bird. And all of these fossils preserve the soft tissues, but there's no obvious visible evidence of color. So for a long time, it was simply thought impossible that evidence of the original colors of ancient organisms uh, would ever be found. And that, you know, it was thought completely improbable that we'd be able to infer their original colors when they were alive. Another problem is that many fossils are colored. But those colors are not the original colors. These colors, such as in the fossils you see here, these are colors that form during the fossilization process. They usually form due to the flow of hot fluids through the rocks. Uh, those fluids are carrying metals such as iron, titanium, manganese, and so on. And uh, when those fluids cool down, they lay down minerals, mineral salts, um, form in the rock when the fluids cool and can generate these colors that aren't the colors that the fossils had when they were alive. They're simply colors that are formed by these different minerals. So the trilobite on the left with the lovely green eye in the red uh, uh, exoskeleton, those reflect just different states of iron, of iron oxides. The lovely purple colors in the feather on the right, those are formed by oxides of titanium and manganese. So when we're looking for fossil color, you know, it would be very easy to be misled by fossils such as these. So you really have to do the detailed chemical analyses to work out what it is you're actually looking at. Now, it's worth actually digressing for a moment and just thinking about what color actually is. 
So color, of course, is something that we perceive with our eyes. It's energy. It's energy from the sun that we perceive with our eyes. And animals can make colors in uh, two different ways. Animals can make colors using chemicals called pigments. We're very familiar with these. Uh, these create many of the common colors that we see around us, from the red colors of the cardinal uh, to the uh, lovely glow of the fireflies and the dark colors of many fungi. These colors are made by pigments, different sorts of pigments. On the other hand, other animals create color not using pigments, so they don't use chemicals, but they use tiny structures in the tissues themselves, structural colors. Now, I've actually done a lot of work on these structural colors preserved in fossils, but I'm not going to dwell on that today. Uh, I'm going to talk more about the pigments. So we do have evidence of pigments in fossils. So going back many decades, we've known that uh, sedimentary rocks such as mudstones can preserve evidence of plant pigments, such as uh, chlorophylls. And chlorophyll is the pigment that gives many, well, most of the plants uh, that we see uh, outdoors, their lovely green coloration. It's the pigment that the plants use to, uh, to generate energy from sunlight in photosynthesis. And we can find evidence of chlorophyll in these sorts of fossils. And we've known that for years. So, you know, on, in one sense, fossil pigments aren't new. They've been with us for a long time but they've been found just as chemicals in rocks. So, you know, they're not particularly useful for in inferring color. Now, there are other fossils where we've actually found pigments locked inside the fossils themselves. So on the top here, you can see a lovely pink sponge called Solenopora. And excuse me one moment, my cat just opened the door. <laughs> sorry, about, sorry about that, um, clever cats. So the pink color in this fossil sponge uh, is made by a unique type of pigment, a spirobore pigment that isn't around today. So we can find evidence of unique uh, pigments in fossils. The lovely purple crinoid calyx here that you see in the bottom, oops, apologies, um, is uh, formed by a, a quinone pigment. And uh, we also have uh, fossil chlorophyll, which has actually been found uh, inside fossil leaves. But really the field of fossil color really took off about, uh, about 13 or 14 years ago um, with the discovery that this particular pigment, melanin, can preserve in fossils. So what is melanin? Well, melanin looks like this. This is a pure extract of melanin that we extracted from tissues of, modern, of, a, of a modern frog. And that melanin looks dark. It's a very dark pigment because it absorbs light at all across the visible spectrum. So it's very, very good at absorbing light. So it's very good at generating dark colors. Um, we find melanin today in the feathers of birds, in the hair of humans and other mammals, in the uh, dark spots, freckles on our skin, uh, but other organisms have melanin too, such as insects, the black spots on the ladybird here, the dark colors in many fungi, and even bacteria are able to generate melanin-like compounds. So we're really, it, melanin is a really common pigment and it's very useful for absorbing sunlight, so it protects us against the harmful effects of UV rays. And uh, it's also used in color patterning, so we use it in camouflage, we use it in uh, sexual display. Other, some plants also contain uh, melanin-like compounds. Now, this is what melanin looks like uh, in invertebrate animals. So here we're looking at a cross-section of a feather. And these are false colors now. So these colors have been added uh, to this image, which was taken with a high-powered electron microscope. And those pink little granules that seem to be spilling out of the feather are granules of melanin. And this is the most common form of melanin in vertebrates, and it is the most common uh, evidence for melanin in the fossil record. So normally when we find fossil melanin, we find these little granules. And here's a, uh, another electron microscope image without the false colors, so you get a better sense of what these things actually look like. And this is melanin, again, that we've extracted from the uh, tissues of, uh, of a modern frog. 
So when it comes to fossil melanin, well, the first evidence was reported originally in the Cenozoic in an, uh, an Eocene feather. But now we've actually found evidence of melanin in many other types of fossils, not just birds uh, and feathered dinosaurs, but going back through deep time, all the way back to the Carboniferous over 300 million years ago. And we found evidence of melanin in very basal vertebrates, such as lampreys, in many different types of fish, in amphibians, um, non-dinosaurian reptiles, ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs, turtles, pterosaurs, feathered dinosaurs, non-feathered dinosaurs, birds, bats, and even a fossil mouse. So we found melanin in many different types of ancient organisms. And the interesting thing about melanin and where much of the early research in this field um, lay was actually using melanin to infer the color of ancient organisms. And there's a, melanin has a very interesting property in modern birds. When you look at uh, these melanin granules or melanosomes that are long, that are elongate, shaped like sausages, these are usually associated with colors that are dark brown to black. Whereas the melanin granules that are more football shaped um, or soccer ball shaped uh, to you guys, uh, these are usually associated with reddish orange, so ginger colors. And so this property was exploited in a lot of the early research to try and infer colors of uh, dinosaurs and ancient birds. And so it's been applied to all of these different types of dinosaurs and marine reptiles that you can see here. And the colors you see are the colors that have been inferred using the shape of melanosomes. So Sinoceropteryx, the first, one of the first dinosaurs for which feather color was reconstructed, it's reconstructed as a ginger color based on its football shaped melanosomes. Whereas in Anchiornis, which our last speaker just mentioned, the different colors in the Anchiornis feathers relate to different shapes of the, uh, of the melanosomes. The football here, the football shaped ones are restricted to the head, the head crest and the cheek, whereas the rest of the body contains those more sausage shaped melanosomes. And, uh, you know, most of these studies have actually gone on to infer what the colors were used for. So we know based on the presence or absence of stripes and patterns and where those occur on the body, well, we've inferred that the colors of these specimens of Sinoceropteryx, Borealopelta, um, marine reptiles, and Cetacosaurus were almost certainly involved in camouflage, in disguising the body outline, uh, especially where we see evidence of counter shading, where we have a dark back and sides and a pale belly, that we see that in a lot of modern animals. But we, and we um, have inferred that, or other researchers have inferred that the colors of Kaihong, Microraptor and Anchiornis uh, were probably used in sexual display, um, especially where we have the, the striking head crest of Anchiornis and the iridescent colors of Kaihong and Microraptor. Modern birds usually use these for uh, sexual display and as a sign of fitness. Um, there's some evidence that in Sinoceropteryx, the striping colors in the tail could have been used as a warning display. And uh, in, again, in Sinoceropteryx and Borealopelta, looking at the type of countershading, we, researchers have been able to infer the sort of light habitats that they occupied. So Sinoceropteryx lived in well-lit habitats, bright habitats, open habitats, whereas Borealopelta, uh, its coloration and the countershading uh, suggests instead that it lived in more shaded, covered habitats. We also know that some animals, some fossil creatures, used melanin for other functions that weren't related to coloration directly, weren't related to signaling. So we know, for instance, that uh, some fossil vertebrates definitely use melanin for photoprotection, especially where we see it in the eye. So the melanin is really important in our eye. It, it occurs in the iris and also in the dark layers at the back of the eye, where it absorbs UV light. It absorbs actually all wavelengths of light. So it prevents us basically from going blind um, from the light rays bouncing around inside the eye. We also um, uh, consider that melanin was used 
for thermoregulation, for helping to maintain a constant body temperature based on where it's found in uh, these some fossil reptiles um, and turtles. And there's also a, some hints that melanin was being used to stiffen the feathers of uh, some feathered dinosaurs and ancient birds, especially where we see dark tips to the wings. So many modern birds do this. They have darker wing tips because they help to stiffen the wings. And so in, they, they, they contribute to the mechanical strength of the wing. So fossil creatures seem to have been using melanin for lots of different purposes, not just color. Now, myself and my research group, we've been interested in where the melanin occurs. So, you know, is melanin restricted to the skin and the feathers, or do you find it in other places? And so we've worked on many different modern animals. Uh, we've looked at, there's a number there of 260. We've now looked at over 300 different uh, tissue types from amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. We've analyzed it in different ways. We've extracted the melanin from the tissues. We've studied it with the electron microscopes and with some other techniques, which I'll mention in a minute. And basically, we've, we came up with some pretty interesting results. So we discovered that melanin is much more widespread than we thought. So yes, we already knew that you find melanin in the eyes, in the skin, and in things like hairs and feathers. But we found actually, when you look at the internal organs, melanin is everywhere. You find it in the gut, you find it in the heart, in the liver, in the um, uh, pancreas, in the lungs. Basically, these granules of melanin are everywhere. Um, so, and this is very interesting from a fossil point of view. So we decided to study the chemistry of this melanin, of this ancient melanin. And we went to uh, this facility here. This is the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, or SLAC. So it's a particle accelerator where electrons are spun really fast around that donut shaped ring you can see in front of you. They're spun around at about a third of the speed of light. And uh, then we basically smash them into our fossils and to try and understand what the, what the melanin, uh, the, the, the chemistry of the melanin. And so here's myself and two of my uh, postgrads analyzing a feathered dinosaur. You can't see me because I'm down here. I've got the very important job of making sure the fossil doesn't fall off the plate while the others screw it on. And, uh, you know, this type of analysis, it's very exciting, very high tech, but it's also very low tech because, you know, in many times in order to fix the fossils in place, we resort to elastic bands, thumbtacks and uh, tape. So this is the low tech side of high tech science. And you get, you've got to get very good at this sort of thing to get the kind of uh, results you need. So when we scan fossils, this is what the results look like. So on the left, you have a picture of a fossil frog that we scanned. And on the right, you're looking at a false color map. And the different colors here correspond to different metals. And we discovered that, there's, that the melanin in different parts of the body uh, is enriched in different metals. So here, for instance, we can see that the, the rock looks red because it's rich in calcium, um, but the melanin inside the body, so in the internal organs of this frog, is really enriched in zinc. And we discovered that this property applies to all modern vertebrates, and uh, we realized then that we could use this, the, the, this property, so by understanding the metal chemistry of melanin, that we could actually start to look at the internal anatomy of fossil creatures. So here we have a fossil tadpole. There's a photograph of it up on the top left. And you don't need to worry about the details here, but all I'm going to tell you, all you need to know is that these different maps uh, are maps for different metals. So straight away you can see, well, we've got a lot of titanium here in the middle of the body. We have a lot of zinc down here in the bottom right in the skin and also the eye. Here uh, we have nickel again, in, part, in, a, in this part of the body. And we have iron up here on the top right in the lungs. So we were able to reconstruct the internal ana anatomy of this fossil tadpole, which you can see here, using the metals that are linked chemically bound to the melanin. So 
because different tissues have different chemistry, we can use melanin chemistry to understand the anatomy of ancient creatures. So we've done it so far for this tadpole and a couple of others. Some We've done it for some amphibians and reptiles and birds. And uh, we're at the moment, we're actually working on a range of different uh, feather dinosaurs and birds. So watch this space for some more interesting results coming out. Now, I'm going to actually segue into the second part of my talk now. And just in case you think that melanin is the only pigment that we can find evidence of in the fossil record, um, uh, well, you're wrong because we find evidence of other pigments. They're less common, but they are there. Now, why is this important? Well, if we were just looking for evidence of melanin, if these animals we see in front of us now were fossilized, this is what we'd infer the colors as, colors as in the fossil record. Oh, sorry, something strange has gone, happened here. Yeah, so if we were reconstructing these colors, based only on melanin, we would see the world in different shades of black and gray and brown. So those other colors, which we saw in these creatures, these are generated by those carotenoids, porphyrins, cetacofulvins, and other pigments. And we do see ev evidence of these preserved in some fossils. I'm going to give you an example uh, that we worked on a few years ago. So what you're looking at here in the upper part of this slide is a fossil snake. And the white stuff in between the bones is, believe it or not, the preserved skin of this snake. This snake is 10 million years old, so compared to dinosaurs, it's a baby, but uh, it's, it's very nicely preserved. And it's from a locality in Spain called Libros, which has all kinds of interesting fossils. Now, we wondered, does that fossil skin preserve any structure? Would we have any chance at finding the pigment cells? So what you're looking at here is a cross section of the skin in a modern snake. There's a very thin layer at the top called the epidermis, that's the outer part of the skin. And then the, most of the skin is in fact this lower layer that's rich in collagen, um, these elastic fibers that keep our skin looking young. And, uh, uh, but this kind of pale brown material here and this black material, these are in fact pigment cells. Here's a close look at the pigment cells. Reptiles have three. So they have xanthophores, which contain carotenoids that produce yellows and reds. They have iridophores that, these are pigment cells that generate, that reflect light. And they have melanophores, which are pigment cells that contain melanin. And there is the collagen at the, at the end or underneath. So we wondered, could we find these in the fossil snake? And it turns out that we can because the skin of this fossil snake is preserved with remarkable fidelity. So here we can see a cross section of the skin of that fossil snake, and it has pretty much all the features of the skin that we see in modern reptiles. So we have the epidermis up here at the top, we have the dermis down here at the bottom, all of those lovely collagen fibers poking out here, and uh, in between we can preserve our fossil pigment cells. And the pigment cells are preserved in this zone here. So this is what we're most interested in. And here's a close-up. Here's a close-up of that upper part of the skin and all of these little blobs, which are shown in close-up on the bottom left, these are the fossil pigment cells. We preserve the iridophores, which are little flat structures. We preserve our, our, um, uh, uh, our xanthophores, which contain our carotenoid granules. And down here, the big pigment cells contain our melanin granules or melanosomes. There are the iridophores, here are the xanthophores, and then down here are the melanophores. So what we did was we sampled skin from different parts of this fossil snake, and we compared, you know, how common these different types of pigment cells were. Uh, oh, just here's some more close-ups of the different pigment cells. And uh, we then went and we looked at a lot of modern reptiles. We looked at modern snakes and uh, lizards, and we looked at how common the different pigment cell types were in skin of different color. And so we were able to actually, um, uh, you know, devise a method for inferring the color based on the abundance, how common those different pigment cell types were. When we went back to the fossil then, this is what we found. So this is just a cartoon showing approximately how common these different types of pigment cell are. So here in the belly, 
we don't really have many of the melanophores, we mostly have the iridophores and the xanthophores. Whereas in different parts of the back and sides, sometimes the melanophores are really common, like down here. Sometimes the, they're less common and we have more of the iridophores and xanthophores and so on. So we get a sense that the color is changing across the body of this fossil. When we used our model uh, from the modern reptiles, these are the colors we're able to uh, reconstruct. So this fossil snake was mostly green, but many different shades of green, some darker, some lighter. It had really dark black patches on its back and sides, and it had a pale belly. So when we think of our artist's reconstruction, which is coming just here, the snake would have looked something like this. Now, I'm not saying that the snake had diamond shapes or chevrons or spots or squares, that we can't say because to, do, to reconstruct the pattern with that level of accuracy, we'd have to sample the whole fossil. And obviously we don't want to do that because there'll be no skin left then for other people to work on in the future. But what we can say is that the snake had many different shades of green on its back, um, some darker, some lighter, and it had a pale belly. And those kinds of colors, when we look at the modern relatives of these snakes today, um, these water snakes, they use these colors for camouflage, for hiding the body in vegetation, basically. Um, although because some of the colors were very bright, it's possible that this color had a dual function and was being used in um, uh, some sexual display as well. So, yeah, and these are some of these are some of the modern relatives and the sorts of color patterns and uh, you know shades of greens that we see. So the really important thing about this fossil, though, is that it shows us that true color reconstructions are possible. So this color this color reconstruction isn't just based on the melanin; it's actually using evidence from other fossil pigments too. The actual pigment cells being preserved. So if we want to do generate true color reconstructions of other fossils, well, then we should be looking for fossils that preserve the skin in this way um, and that can preserve these different pigment cells. Um, the last thing I'll mention is just very briefly, what about dinosaur skin? Could we do this with the skin of dinosaurs? Now, many dinosaurs do preserve skin, um, but you know, in many cases, uh, well, very little of it has been studied with uh, modern techniques, so we don't know what's actually there. Here are some examples from some fossil skin that we worked on, myself and some colleagues, a couple of years ago. So on the top left, you're looking at an electron microscope image of some fossil feathers, and the white patches are patches of skin. When you look at the patches of skin uh, you know, with higher magnification, we can actually start to resolve individual cells. You get a sense of there you know, being um, divisions or some uh, uh, polygons here. And on the bottom right, you're getting a close-up of one of those polygons. And excuse me, the level of preservation is actually remarkable. So what you're looking at there is a single uh, skin cell, a corneocyte from the very outermost part of the skin. It's so well preserved, we, we can see the details of the individual fibers of keratin that make up those cells. So even though the preservation is really good, is remarkable in fact, and it actually tells us interesting things about the metabolism of feathered dinosaurs, it doesn't tell us about their color because we don't preserve the lower parts of the skin. So what I would say is I think it's possible under the right conditions to preserve those lower most skin, those lower skin levels that have the pigment cells, but they don't preserve in these uh, particular fossils here. Yeah, so we have, we have yeah. Um, the very last thing I'll mention is that, you know, when we think about fossil color, uh, we shouldn't just restrict ourselves to dinosaurs, mammals, etc. We've We could also look at pterosaurs. And in the last couple of years, we've been working on fossil pterosaurs. We've uh, discovered that they did, in fact, preserve feathers. And, uh, you know, if we've got feathers in pterosaurs, well, this, and we've got feathers in their dinosaur relatives, this probably means that feathers were present in the ancestor of the two groups. So in the um, ancestor, common ancestor of pterosaurs and dinosaurs back in the early Triassic. Uh, now, and that's interesting because it opens up a whole new world in terms of studying fossil color. Here are what those 
feathers look like in the pterosaurs. They are branched. They're not quite like the feathers of modern birds. They have a, they have a, a more simple branching pattern, but they are feathers. So watch this space. We have a very exciting study coming out next month. I can't really say any more, but um, uh, keep your eyes peeled. We're going to have something very exciting coming out about uh, pterosaur feathers and color in the next few weeks. And uh, yeah, based on these little things, these are some pigment cells preserved in pterosaurs. So that's pretty much all I've got to uh, talk to you about today, folks. Um, if, if there's a couple of take home messages here, I would ask you to remember that melanin preserves in many fossils. Um, it is useful for inferring color, but it also tells us that animals were using uh, melanin for other functions, for thermoregulation, for um, uh, stiffening their tissues. And also we have all these internal melanins that were only really at the tip of the iceberg when it comes to understanding what those are doing in our bodies. Maybe they're involved in metal regulation. Um, and also remember that it's not just melanin that can fossilize, we can preserve evidence of other pigments too. So there is hope for reconstructing true colors of many fossil creatures. But there's an awful lot more to do. We're literally just, this field of fossil color is in its infancy. So uh, we've, we have a lifetime of work ahead of us. So thank you very much for listening.